Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Targeting the Glycoimmune Checkpoints, Siglix, to Enhance Antiviral Innate Immune Functions. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by GenScript. To learn more, visit them at genscript.com. Now, we encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you might have during this presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. Our speakers will answer any questions via the email address you provided at the time of registration. And you may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation. I'd now like to welcome our speaker today, Mohammed Abdel Mohsen, Associate Professor at the Vaccine and Immunotherapy Center in Immunology, Microenvironment and Metastasis Program in the Ellen and Ronald Kaplan Center, Cancer Center. Mohammed, welcome to you. You may now begin your presentation. Thanks for the introduction and um, um, hi everyone. Today, I want to um, give you an, a quick overview of the, some of the work we are doing in our lab at the Western Institute. And in our lab, we work in the interface between the fields of, um, just, sorry, trying, yeah, sorry, going back. Trying, in our lab, we work in the interface between the field of virology, immunology, yeah, not sure why the sliders are not advancing correctly, but, and, and glycobiology. And it's pretty obvious why we need to study um, immunological function during viral infection. Uh, but I would like to start, but what is glycobiology and why should we care? So I usually like to start with this very simple uh, fact that is every single living cell on Earth are covered with a heavy layer of glycan sugar on their cell surface. And um, in the last few years, there is many advances in the field of glycobiology that be, make it clear that is these glycans are biologically active molecules that can uh, impact several immunological functions during many diseases, including cancers. And in fact, there is many important work that's being done on the cancer uh, related to glycobiology in the last few years that is, you definitely need to check out but not as much in infectious diseases, including virology. And that's why today I want to give you an example of how glycans can modulate immunological functions during viral infection. And in particular, I will focus on something called glycoimmune chick bones. And I'm sure all of you are quite familiar with uh, classic immune negative chick bones that um, are work by protein-protein interactions. So for an example, the protein BD1 expressed in immune cells bind to another protein called BDL1 on surface of target cells, uh, including cancer cells. And these interactions inhibit immune functions and allow, uh, for an example, cancer cells to evade immune surveillance. Now, and, and that's why this is obviously a promising uh, ways to enhance immunity uh, during cancer and other diseases. So now recently it become clear there is another class of immune negative chick bones that work by binding to sugars and that's why they call glycoimmune negative chick bones. So again let me start this bar by telling you that is every immune cell express several uh, sugar binding proteins or also called lectins on their cell surface and the binding between some of those lectins expressed on the immune cells and specific or certain sugar on the surface of target cells plays very important role in the ability of these uh, immune cells to recognize and target these target cells. And that's why many cancer cells, many, many virally infected cells, uh, try to decorate themselves with specific sugar in order to um, ensure binding to some of those inhibitory lectins and evade uh, immune uh, surveillance. And obviously this is representing an, a, good, a good possibility uh, to block those glycoimmune negative chick bones to enhance immunity. So today I will give you, I will focus on one of those glycoimmune negative chick bones and I will first show you how this 
uh, glycoimmune negative shake points interactions can play an important role in regulating innate immune functions during HIV infection, which is some of this work was published in this paper uh, last year uh, in this project that was led by Samson Adeniji, a postdoc in our lab. And then after this, I will show you how the exact same glycoimmune negative shake points could play an important role in modulating uh, immunity against SARS-CoV-2 infection. So start with the first part on, um, on HIV. And before I get into how this glycoimmune negative shock point can impact HIV immunity or immunity against HIV, I want to spend a quick minute telling you why we still need to understand immunological functions during HIV infection, despite the fact that we currently have a very effective antiretroviral therapy or also called ART that can effectively suppress viral replication. And the reason is that antiretroviral therapy or ART do not, does not cure HIV. And despite how many years of therapy, there always be a large number of HIV infected cells that persist in the blood and it multiple tissues in the body. And these cells can hide from the immune system in a ways we don't understand. But because of those cells, regardless how many years in therapy, once it's stopping it, the virus rebound within a couple of weeks. It doesn't matter if the patient on therapy for five years, 10 years, 15 years, once it's stopping therapy, the virus will rebound very quickly. So a lifelong therapy is necessary for those 37 million people living with HIV worldwide, including 2 million children. And now lifelong therapy is associated with several uh, problem. I will just highlight one of those problem now, which is the fact that is people living with HIV, regardless of viral suppression, are still suffering from high incidence of many aging and inflammation associated diseases, including neurological impairments, cardiovascular diseases, cancers, and whatnot. Now these diseases happen at much higher rate and sometimes at much lower age in HIV infected individual compared to their HIV negative counterparts. So that's why there is still a lot of interest in finding a way or ways to enhance immunity, to eliminate these HIV infected cells, to cure HIV and prevent these significant complications. So now this project started in our lab a couple of years ago uh, when we asked the question, do HIV infected cells have different glycans on their cell surface compared to HIV uninfected cells? And taking a longer story short, because this was published in this paper a couple of years ago, we indeed found that is the HIV infected cells uh, have a glycomic signature to them that uh, uh, different than the glycomic signature on the surface of HIV uninfected cells. And one of the features of this glycomic signature was an upregulation of this sugar called alpha-2,3 sialic acid. And this was interesting for us because alpha-2,3 sialic acid is a sugar ligand of one of those glycoimmune negative shake points lectins I mentioned to you. And this one in particular called cyclic 9. So cyclic 9 is a sugar binding protein that express on the surface of many immune cells, including on a subset of the cytotoxic NK cells. And when cyclic 9 express on NK cells uh, bind to alpha-2,3 sialic acid, express on a target cells, this binding in send an inhibitory signal to the NK cells and allow the target cells to evade NK immune surveillance. So now knowing that it's HIV infected cells do have a high level of alpha-2,3 sialic acid on their cell surface, we naturally ask it the question, do cyclic 9 sialic acid interactions contribute to the ability of HIV infected cells to evade NK immune surveillance? But before we even attempt to answer this question, we wanted to do a very simple test. We reason that is if these NK cells expressing cyclic 9, this inhibitory lectin cyclic 9 plays any role whatsoever during HIV infection, we should see a correlation in vivo in patient between the percentage of these in key cell that express this inhibitory receptor cyclic 9 here in the X axis in both the top and the bottom panels and level of HIV, either level of HIV viremia in the plasma on individual when they are not on therapy or remnant HIV 
when the patient are in therapy. And we reason that is we should see a positive correlation, right? The more NK cell that express an inhibitory receptor, the more virus, more immune inhibition, more virus, right? Makes sense. But to our surprise, we found a negative correlation in both cases, which didn't make any sense to us. Why more NK cell that expressing an inhibitory receptor to immune system, to immune function, correlate negatively or with correlate, uh, the more of it correlate with less virus. And at this point, we thought that is maybe just, just a random in vivo correlation. It's just a correlation after all. It doesn't show any causality. And maybe it's just a random correlation that doesn't mean anything in vivo. And we just decided to ignore it until this paper came out where the authors investigate the role of the exact same NK uh, subpopulation that express cyclic 9, but now during hepatitis B viral infection. And they also reported this correlation in their paper. Uh, between cyclic, this NK cell that expresses cyclic 9 and level of hepatitis B viral DNA. And unfortunately, the author didn't try to explain this counterintuitive correlation, but it struck us and how similar it is to what we found during HIV. Again, negative correlation. And at this point, we thought that is maybe this negative correlation actually real. Maybe they do have a uh, significant biological meaning. That is, we just don't understand what is this meaning. And it was at this point that is, it came to us that is maybe we are confusing the subpopulation that express cyclic 9 with the cyclic 9. Now, the cyclic 9, the molecule itself, is inhibitory. There is definitely inhibitory. There is no question about that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that is the NK subpopulation that express this inhibitory receptor are inhibited and are less cytotoxic because the cytotoxicity of NK cells is a balance between the expression of several NK activating receptors and markers and several NK inhibitory receptors and markers. And it's possible that is this NK subpopulation that express cyclic 9, regardless of their expression of cyclic 9, are actually highly activated and highly cytotoxic because maybe they do express high level of several NK activating receptors and markers, and maybe low level of other inhibitory receptors and marker uh, beside, uh, uh, regardless of cyclic 9 expression, which would actually explain our negative correlation here. So we started to explore this alternative hypothesis that is the cyclic 9 positive NK cells are actually more activated and more cytotoxic against HIV infected cells compared to the cyclic 9 uh, negative subpopulation. And we started exploring this by simply uh, measuring uh, the expression of several NK activating and inhibitory receptor on the surface of cyclic 9 positive cells here in solid dot uh, and comparing them to uh, compare it to the expression uh, on cyclic 9 negative cells here in open circles. And we use cells isolated from either HIV uninfected individuals, HIV infected individual on therapy, or HIV infected individual uh, uh, not on therapy. And as you can see here, the expression of several NK activating receptors and markers, including CD16, CD38, NKB30, peripherin, DNAM, are higher on cyclic 9 positive cells compared to cyclic 9 negative cells. On the other hand, the expression of several important inhibitory receptors to NK, like NKG2A, TIGET, are lower on cyclic 9 positive cells compared to cyclic 9 negative cells, regardless of HIV disease status. So, so far, we know in vivo that is these cells having an activated phenotype and they do exhibit a negative correlation with HIV, all suggesting that is these cells are actually more activated and more cytotoxic against HIV infected cells. And if you really think about that, this is not something very weird because uh, classic immune negative checkpoints like BD1 are usually expressed in highly activated, highly differentiated T cells. That is, they now need to express BD1 to restrain their high activation and cytotoxicity. So now we wanted to explore if indeed cyclic 9 positive cells are more cytotoxic against HIV infected cells compared to cyclic 9 negative, which is we use different approaches in order to answer this question. In one of the approach, we just simply uh, deplete cyclic 9 
positive cells from NK. As you can see here, total NK will have about 40% of the cells expressing cyclic 9. We can nicely deplete this cyclic 9 positive uh, subpopulation, and then we use the wall NK cell that contains cyclic 9 subpopulation and the cyclic 9 depleted NK cells in a killing assays against HIV infected uh, cell lines, obviously at the same effector to target ratio, with the idea if cyclic 9 positive NK cells plays an important role in killing HIV infected cells, we should see a reduction in the killing of HIV infected cells when we use a cyclic 9 depleted NK cells, which is indeed what we see here. You can see uh, when we measure NK degranulation or cytotoxicity using two different assays, LDH release and, and uh, CFSE red assay, you can see the total NK cells here in blue can degranulate and kill HIV infected cells better than cyclic 9 the cyclic 9 depleted NK cells here in yellow, kind of indirect evidence that is indeed cyclic 9 positive cells are more cytotoxic against HIV infected cells compared to cyclic 9 negative cells, which is something we want NICS to directly evaluate by sorting cyclic 9 negative NK cells from cyclic 9 positive NK cells and then co culture them with HIV infected cell lines. And as you can see here in the left panel, the cyclic 9 positive NK cells are indeed more cytotoxic compared to the cyclic 9 negative NK cells toward HIV infected cells. And in the left side, that is confirmed when we look at the degranulation of these cells. And indeed, again, the cyclic 9 positive NK cells can degranulate more toward HIV infected cells compared to the cyclic 9 negative NK cells. So we know so far that is indeed the cyclic 9 negative positive NK cells are more activated in vivo and more cytotoxic in vitro compared to the cyclic 9 negative NK cells, which is consistent with, our, with the negative correlation we see with HIV in vivo. But then the question, Nick, is what about their expression of cyclic 9? Yes, these, these NK cells expressing cyclic 9 are more cytotoxic against HIV. But is that possible that is their expression of the inhibitory receptor cyclic 9 is still restraining their high cytotoxicity? And if we were to block cyclic 9, we can even unleash a higher cytotoxicity from these cells against HIV infected cells. And the answer is yes. We, when we made a blocking antibody for cyclic 9 with uh, help of, of gene scrap, and we used this uh, blocking antibody in a co-culture assays against HIV infected cells using total NK cells, we can indeed dramatically enhance the ability of these NK cells to kill HIV infected cells. And this antibody was specific for cyclic 9 because if we now do this experiment, but instead of using total NK cells, we use a cyclic 9 depleted NK cells, the antibody do not have any effect because there is no target cells for it. This experiment was done using a cell lines infected with HIV, but we could also recapitulate this data using autologous assays where we isolate BBMCs uh, from uh, individuals and we isolate CD4 from those BBMCs, infect them with HIV, and in the same time, we isolate NK from the same donors, and then we co-culture those uh, HIV infected CD4 T cells, T cells, and NK cells in the presence or absence of an isotype control or the cyclic 9 blocking antibody. And then we can do different measurements. We can look for the effect of the cyclic 9 blocking antibody on the NK degranulation. And as you can see here, indeed, the blocking antibody uh, significantly enhances the ability of the NK cells to degranulate against HIV infected cells. We can look for the amount of HIV infected cells um, remaining, and you can see that is the blocking antibody compared to the isotype control can cause a reduction in the level of HIV infected cells. We can take the culture supernatant from those co-culture and try to infect new cells, and you can see that is the culture supernatant from the co-culture in the presence of the um, cyclic 9 blocking antibody here in red uh, can lead to less infection compared to the isotype control in gray or the no antibody in blue. 
So now from this part, we know, or we can summarize, that is, we found that is surprisingly, that is this NK cell that expresses this inhibitory receptor cyclic 9 are actually highly activated and highly cytotoxic against virally infected cells. And that is maybe due to their high expression of several NK activating receptors and markers like NKP30, DNAP, and lower expression of other inhibitory receptor like NKG2A compared to the cyclic 9 negative NK cells. However, we also found that the Z, Z cell expression of cyclic 9 is still restraining their full cytotoxicity. And if we were to block this in uh, interaction, we couldn't unleash a uh, even a higher cytotoxicity against virally infected cells from these already highly cytotoxic NK cells. And the next question for us was, now we know that is a cyclic 9 sialic acid interaction, do play a role in the ability of HIV infected cells to evade NK immune surveillance. The next question, can we design a selective approach to break the cyclic 9 sialic acid interaction in order to enhance the susceptibility of HIV infected cells to NK mediated clearance. And we reasoned that is we can use this enzyme called sialidase. So sialidase is an enzyme that is, can cut sialic acid from the surface of cells, can cut sialic acid, including alpha-2,3 sialic acid. And however, if we were to use sialidase, this will just cut sialic acid from the surface of HIV infected cells and HIV uninfected cells. So we borrowed an, uh, a great idea in the cancer field that is, was done by Karen Bertozzi and other to conjugate these salades to an antibody. And for our case, we reasoned that is, if we conjugate salades to an HIV-specific antibody, the idea here that is the HIV-specific antibody will steer the salades to the surface of HIV-infected cells, cutting salic acid only from the HIV-infected cells, without impacting HIV infect uninfected cells. So now cutting the sialic acid from the surface of HIV infected cells will enhance their susceptibility to NK mediated clearance without impacting the surface of HIV uninfected cells. And indeed, when we uh, produce those HIV antibodies, again with the help of genus CREP, and then conjugate them to sialidase, uh, which is the work of uh, 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 um, uh, our colleague Han, Han Zio in Rice University, and when and then we tested uh, the ability of this conjugate to remove sialic acid from the surface of HIV infected cells, but not HIV uninfected cells. So what we did is we mixed HIV infected cells here in this fax plots in the right, and HIV uninfected cells in the left, and the, both type of cells were in the same tube. And then we stained them for sialic acid here in the y-axis. And when we treated these cells with a small concentration of um, uh, the conjugates, uh, and in this case, we use an antibody called NIH4546, which is HIV-specific antibody, and we conjugate them with a salidase. We use 25 nanomole, and you can see here, even at this lower concentration, the level of sialic acid is reduced dramatically from the surface of HIV-infected cells, but not HIV-uninfected cells. We can increase the concentration of the conjugate, and you can see a nice dose-dependent reduction on the level of sialic acid from the surface of HIV-infected cells, but not from the surface of HIV-uninfected cells. So we know that there's some specificity to the, uh, to the conjugate in removing sialic acid only from the surface of HIV-infected cells. And the next obvious question, does that lead to potentiating NK killing against these cells? And we tested that again using different models, and I'm here showing you one example, when again we cultured or mixed HIV uninfected cells here in red, and we dyed them with a red color, or HIV infected cells, and we dyed them with a green color. And you can see that here with this live imaging staining, or also the number of the cells in this bar graphs. Then we added to those cells, NK cells isolated from HIV infected individuals, and you can see the NK will start killing HIV infected cells. You can see in a, about two uh, twofold reduction in the level of HIV infected cells uh, compared to the control with no impact on the HIV uninfected cells here in red. We can as, add an isotype control and nothing much happens. 
we can add an HIV specific antibody at two different concentrations, and you can see the two fold reduction in the level of HIV infected cells became five or six fold reduction because those antibody will elicit antibody mediated cytotoxicity. And you can clearly see that is in uh, the, uh, the level of HIV infected cells dramatically reduced. And you wonder if there is even a space for the conjugate to reduce this further. And indeed, this, when we add the same concentration of Z conjugate uh, instead of the antibody, you can see the five, six fold reduction become 25 to 50 fold reduction. And you can barely see any HIV infected cells in the culture. And most importantly, with very minimal impact, if, 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 if there is impact at all, on HIV uninfected cells in red. Again, this experiment was using cell line infected with HIV, and we could recapture the same result using autologous system, uh, primary cell, where we infect CD4 T cells and co culturalize them with BBMCs from the same individuals in the presence or absence of uh, the antibody or the antibody conjugates. And we can, again, measure two different things, either in key degranulation, yeah, either as expression of CD1, CD107 or co-expression between CD107 and interferon gamma or CD107 and TNF alpha. And in all of those cases, you can see that there's two different concentration of the conjugates uh, here in bright red can uh, lead to higher NK degranulation compared to the exact same two concentration of the antibody alone here in dark red. And obviously this uh, resulted in a reduction in the level of HIV infected cells when using this conjugates again in bright red compared to the antibody alone in dark red. So just to summarize this part, uh, and just as this is just an, a quick example of how studying glycobiology could allow us to identify a novel glycoimmune checkpoint mechanism that may be exploited by HIV infected cells, and I will show you how that might be also true for other virally infected cells to evade immune surveillance. And how this information was actually useful and allowed us to develop a proof of concept approach to selectively enhance the susceptibility of HIV infected cells to immune mediated clearance by using this Cialidase HIV specific antibody conjugates, which is now we obviously advancing to animal studies. But that is will lead me to the second part of my presentation, which is a question, is this a specific for HIV or this sialic acid cyclic interaction could also contribute to the ability of other virally infected cells to evade immune surveillance, which is obviously I will focus on SARS-CoV-2 infected cells. And I, the work I will show you, Nick, is, uh, is, is, is uh, work of uh, Britt Massini, another postdoc in our lab. And probably all of you know that a severe COVID-19 is associated with several alteration to the profile of many immune cells in our body, including alteration to the profile of NK cells. This has been shown in several publications, but it's unclear whether this alteration can cause uh, alteration to the functions of these NK cells. These NK cells are expressing different markers, but does that mean that is the NK functions uh, during severe COVID-19 are impaired. And uh, as uh, all of you know, NK cells can either kill directly by direct cytotoxicity, making an, a direct synapse between the NK cells and infected cells, or they can bind to the FC portion of uh, 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 antigen-specific antibody in order to make uh, another synapse that is, will allow them to kill by something called antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity or ADCC. So it's not clear of these anti-SARS-CoV-2 NK function, either direct cytotoxicity or ADCC are impaired during severe COVID-19 and what host factor might modulate these functions. So we first wanted to answer this question whether this alteration lead to re reduction in the functions. So we collected samples from uh, SARS-CoV-2 negative controls, SARS individual with mild COVID-19 or hospitalized COVID-19. And first, we confirmed what is known in the literature that is indeed the NK cells in those individual with hospitalized COVID-19 have different alteration. They do express lower CD16, higher CD57, higher cyclic 7 several other alterations. So we know that these individual we collected are representative of what is going on in the literature. Next, is we wanted to ask if these cells, NK cells, have lower functionality. So we did that by either culture these BPMCs from those negative, mild, or hospitalized COVID-19 patients by themselves 
or co-culture them with a target cells, a cell line that is expressing SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. We did this co-culture also between the BBMCs and the target cells in the presence uh, or absence of an antibody that is not specific for SARS-CoV-2 or SARS-CoV-2 specific antibody in order to evaluate EDCC. And then we left this culture for 16 hours and then we measure NK degranulation as a marker of NK functionality. In order to measure direct cytotoxicity, we just subtracted the NK degranulation we get from the co-culture between the BBMCs and the target cells to the BBMCs alone. In order to measure EDCC, we subtracted the uh, degranulation we're getting when we use an antibody specific for SARS-CoV-2 from the co-culture when we use an antibody non-specific for SARS-CoV-2 after normalizing both condition to the uh, BBMC's control. So indeed, as we hypothesize that is this alteration are indeed associated with less functionality. These NK cells from individual with hospitalized COVID-19 are less capable of degranulating as measured by the co-expression of CD1 with 7 interferon gamma or uh, cyto or releasing cytokine like interferon gamma or co-expression of interferon gamma and TNF alpha compared to the NK cells isolated from the mild or negative uh, or SARS-CoV-2 negative individual. And that is uh, in the case of direct cytotoxicity. This is also true for ADCC. These cells are less capable of eliciting ADCC compared uh, when they are isolated from hospitalized COVID-19 patient compared to individual with mild COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 negative individual. We also measure the level of how much virus in the blood in those individuals by measuring the uh, level of N antigen. And as you can see here in the uh, X axis, the ability of the NK cells to either elicit direct cytotoxicity and degranulate negatively correlate with how much virus in the body. So the, more, the less NK functionality, the more virus. So now we know that is the NK cells from hospitalized COVID-19 patients are indeed less capable of eliciting SARS, anti-SARS-CoV-2 direct cytolytic and EDCC activity compared to NK from control. We ask us the question, does sialic acid cyclic interaction contribute to this less functionality? And as we found during HIV infection, we indeed also found that is the cyclic nine positive in key cells here in solid dots are capable of eliciting higher ADCC compared to the cyclic nine negative in key cells. So they are also highly cytotoxic against SARS-CoV-2 cells. You can see that when we use cells from negative, mild, hospitalized, that is a cyclic nine positive in key cells here in solid dots capable of eliciting higher ADCC compared to the cyclic 9 negative NK cells when we measure CD1 or 7 degranulation. Same true when we measure cytokine release, interferon gamma, TNF alpha. Again, these cells are capable of degranulating and releasing cytokine better than the cyclic 9 negative control. Even when we measure also uh, degranulation plus cytokine release, uh, we get the same message. When we then correlate the ability of the cyclic 9 positive or cyclic 9 negative cells to elicit either direct cytotoxicity or EDCC and level of virus antigen in the body, we found that is, there is no, uh, the, the ability of cyclic 9 negative and cyclic 9 positive uh, cells to elicit EDCC do correlate negatively with, um, with, with the N antigen, but without difference between the cyclic 9 negative and cyclic 9 positive. But when we focus on ADCC, we found that as a cyclic 9 positive cells, uh, ability to degranulate or release cytokine correlate negatively with uh, how much antigen only in the cyclic 9 positive cells, but not in the cyclic 9 negative cells, suggesting that as a cyclic 9 positive cells are playing an important role in the ADCC activity against cyclic 9. And next, we then also ask us the question, do these cells have an activated and mature phenotype during SARS-CoV-2 as we observe it during HIV? And the answer is yes. We indeed found that as a cyclic 9 positive in K cells, again here in solid dots, are expressing high level of CD16, which is again important marker for eliciting ADCC compared to cyclic 9 negative cells. Again, regardless of disease status, these cells are more mature. They are expressing CD57, which is a maturation marker compared uh, to cyclic 9 negative cells. They do express high level of NKG2C, which is an activating markers. 
and they do express lower level of NKG2A, which is an uh, inhibitory marker. So similar to what we found during HIV, these cells are more activated and more cytotoxic against uh, uh, um, HIV and SARS-CoV-2 infected targets uh, compared to um, cyclic 9 negative cells. And again, the next question, these cells still express cyclic 9. And if we were to block this interaction, against, again, using a cyclic 9 blocking antibody, that is, again, we use the help of gene script to making, can we enhance the anti-SARS-CoV-2 ADCC activity? And as you can see here, compared to an isotype control, when we use a cyclic 9 blocking antibody, we can see an increase in several markers of degranulation and cytokine release, CD107, CD107 co-expression with interferon gamma or TNF-alpha or even TNF-alpha expression or co-expression between TNF alpha and interferon gamma, that is the cyclic 9 blocking antibody, could enhance the ability of those cells to degranulate. But the next question is this degranulation is actually equal to lysing the uh, cells. So we use this uh, targeting killing assay when we have a target cells expressing SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, and these cells have one part of luciferase, and the media have the other part of the luciferase. So we co-culture this with NK cells, in the presence of uh, uh, anti-SARS-CoV-2 spike antibodies. And the idea is when the cells are being uh, lysed, the part of the luciferase inside the cells will go to the outside the cells, bind with the other part, and we can measure the cell lysis by luciferase activation. And the idea here is we, when we do that, uh, without cyclic 9 blocking antibody, we see some level of killing but the hypothesis, if we were to block cyclic 9 using the cyclic 9 blocking antibody, we can even lead to higher uh, cell lysis, that is, we can measure by luciferase. Uh, so we examine if that is true, and the answer is absolutely, this is true. When we use an anti-cyclic 9 blocking antibody, we can enhance the lysis of the SARS-CoV-2 specific target cells by ADCC. So again, going back to this uh, model, similar to what I showed you with HIV, in this model, we also found that the cyclic 9 positive cells are indeed highly activated and highly cytotoxic against SARS-CoV-2. So it's not just a specific for HIV and can be applicable for many other viral infection. And that is, again, probably due to their high expression of several inky activating markers and receptor like inky G2C and lower expression of inhibitory receptor like inky G2A compared to uh, cyclic 9 negative inky cells. However, again, we found that the cyclic 9 sialic acid interaction is still restraining this uh, cytotoxicity. And if we were to use a blocking antibody for cyclic 9, we can enhance the NK cytotoxicity against uh, SARS CoV 2 infected cells. So, this is just one quick example, actually, with how glycans could be important for. Uh, immunity against uh, HIV, uh, I mean, virally infected cells. But again, in the last few years, there is many advances in this field of glycobiology. And there is many areas uh, that is, um, we, uh, in these advances, we can learn more about viral host interactions. And if you want to learn more about that, I will refer you to the several review article and several paper we write in several uh, direction that is we can learn from the recent advances of glycobiology in order to better understand viral host interaction against HIV, against SARS-CoV-2, and perhaps against many other viral infection. And with that, I would like to go to my acknowledgement slides. Uh, first and foremost, thanking all of the volunteer participants in our um, uh, different studies, uh, thanking different folks in our lab who did the work, um, uh, our collaborator with and without uh, outside Worcester, our funders, and thank you for your attention, and I will be happy to take any questions. And thank you, Mohammed. We appreciate that presentation. And would you do us a, a favor and go ahead and refresh your screen at the top left because you were not, um, you were frozen during the part of your presentation. And while you are refreshing, I just want to welcome our audience to the Q&A portion of the webinar. And if you have any questions you want to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's get started, Mohammed. It looks like we already have some great questions coming in, and thank you so much for refreshing. Our first question is, <clears throat> since um, 
in addition to Siglex, are there any other glycol immune checkpoints that had been reported with antiviral or anti-tumor immunity? Yeah, definitely for anti-tumor, as I mentioned, there is a lot of great work is being done in this area for in the cancer field. So there is many other um, lectins that this could play a very important role during cancers, including selectins, which is bind to specific kind of focus. Uh, there is also DC cyan. Um, um, galactins are very important immune, uh, I mean, uh, immunomodulatory lectins. And again, there is many different papers showing that is many of those lectin and their interactions could negatively or positively impact uh, uh, immunity in different ways, in a way that this can impact cancer, but they also uh, can impact virally infected, cell, virally infected cells. We have also published paper on galactins. We have working on selectins. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, this is like a um, non-necessary, very mainstream science. There is uh, an evolving field uh, rapidly. And uh, I think we will see even more and more in the next few years and uh, the important rules or rule uh, of glycan that is usually neglected in modulating immunity during both cancer and infectious diseases. Thank you so much. Now, since anti-tumor immunity and antiviral immunity are two different checking scenarios, do you develop the antibody specific to each scenario or just one? Well, uh, I, I think the Important part because those salic, uh, those uh, sorry, glycans are very abundant. They are ev in every cell in our body. So the main challenge is to how to get specificity, and that's why we, for an example, in our example on HIV, we wanted to conjugate uh, conjugate salidase to HIV specific antibody to ensure that is we are interrupting this interaction only on the surface of HIV infected cells because sialic acid cyclic are important for immunity. So if you were to block them non-specifically, you might get non-specific reaction like inflammation, autoimmunity. So I think it will be very important to try to be adding a specificity to your antibody either by making them bi-specific, tri-specific antibody that is a go and target only your virally infected cells or your cancer cells without impacting your uh, healthy cells. So if, if, if that will be the goal, you will uh, probably your anti the, the cyclic antibody part will be the same, but you will need to add something to it to uh, infer specificity, um, which is will be <laughs> obviously different between tumor and virus and between different viruses. Thank you, Mohammed. And I want to thank our audience for these great questions. Our next question, have you confirmed that Siglex 9 ligands are expressed on SARS CoV 2 or infected cells? Yes, yes. So do the not from we we confirm it that using these cells we are using in our assays, but we did not do that using actual cells infected. We didn't have an access to that, like you know. Um, real cells infected, that's the cells we infect in vitro or we are, or do express a SARS-CoV-2 spike and we use them in our killing assays. Those cells do have the cyclic 9 ligand, but obviously it will be important to know if the actual cells in the body, the lung cells uh, that do express, uh, that do are naturally infected with SARS-CoV-2 do express uh, alpha-2,3 salic acid. Many cells, most cells in the body will express alpha-2,3 salic acid. It's not something specific to virally infected cells, but the question will be, do they express it more? We could find that during our HIV studies, because obviously we can isolate easily T cells from the blood and examine their glycome. But obviously for SARS-CoV-2, that will be a much challenging task because we will need cells from the lung. That is, we know infected with SARS-CoV-2 and, and whatnot, which is something we haven't done. Thank you, Mohammed. And how do you connect those SIGLEC checkpoints from anti-tumor immunity to antiviral immunity? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. So in our studies, we <clears throat> keep being surprised in how viruses seems to employ same or very similar uh, ways to evade immune surveillance similar to cancer. So in the cancer field, it is known for a long time that is 
cancer cells uh, in, have high level of sialic acid on their cells cell surface or something called hypersalylation. They do intentionally express high level of sialic acid in order to ensure binding to cyclic and evade immune surveillance. So we were surprised that as many viral viral infection do the same thing. They do in they do express they when they infect the cells, they find a way to increase the level of sialic acid on their cell surface in order to uh, again maybe evade immune surveillance. we many cancer cells do uh, express the ligand of another important lectin called selectin because that helps them to disseminate, to move from the blood to the tissues, which is important for the cancer cells to metastasize. We found also that as virally infected cells can enhance the ligand of selectin, which is called Sialal Lewis X, which helps cells to migrate. So obviously we don't have uh, a, a very clear evidence, but from our different studies, we keep finding that is there might be a very shared mechanism of how both cancer and virally infected cells take advantage of the you know regular cell biology because salic acid cyclic interaction was, is not there for cancer to evade immune surveillance or for virally infected cells to evade immune surveillance. It does have a very important role in controlling inflammation and autoimmunity in the body. Selectin interaction are not there for, again, virally infected cells or tumor to disseminate between tissues. They are there to help immune cells to uh, move to the site of inflammation. But somehow both cancer cells and virally infected cells could hijack those systems for their benefit. And again, we keep finding that is uh, both tumor and virally infected cells seems to use shared mechanism. And that's why we uh, sometimes, you know, learning from the cancer field and apply to virally infected cells and vice versa uh, because of this potential shared mechanism. Thank you so much. And what type of carbohydrate recognize the lectin and what lectin do you use? Yeah, it depends on the lectins. Our body has many lectins, tens of lectins, and each one of those lectins do have a specific uh, glycan binding specificity. And it's not 100% clear, actually, but we know, for an example, as I mentioned, cyclics usually bind to sialic acid. There are many cyclics. Uh, I think it's up to 16 cyclics, and they are different between mice and human. Each one of those cyclics can bind to a specific kind of sialic acid because not all sialic acids are the same. Selectin, there are three of them, B-selectin, E-selectin, L-selectin, and again, they bind to specific kind of focosylated glycans and so on and so off. So um, uh, so the, the dif different, different lectin do have different glycan or carbohydrate uh, recognition, and those are the ones in human. Mice will have different lectin with different uh, glycan recognition. Uh, plants will have their own lectin with lectin recognition. And actually, the plant lectin are uh, very commonly used in the field of glycobiology in order to measure glycans because their glycan specificity is relatively well understood. Uh, we use different lectins in our uh, study, depends on the uh, project and the goal. Thank you so much. Now, we have time for a couple more questions. How specific is salidase in eliminating the salic acid lit lit ligand that mm -hmm. Silic 9 recognizes? And this is a two-part question. What can we find alpha, where, where can we find alpha 2,3 salic acids in our body and our tissues or any particular cell types? Yeah, so the salidase will not be specific to the cyclic line, cyclic nine ligand in particular. Salidase will just remove cyclic nine from a uh, sialic acid for uh, all sialic acid. Uh, when we test it, it does take all alpha two three sialic acid, but it will also take the sialic acid from other ligand, and that's why it was very important to conjugate that to HIV specific antibody, because if we wouldn't do that, you would just remove all sialic acid from HIV uninfected cells. We reason that is removing all sialic acid from HIV infected cells from the surface of HIV infected cells might be good, might be even better than try to target alpha-2-3 sialic acid in particular, because there are other cyclics like cyclic 7 also can help these cells to evade NK immune surveillance. By using salidase, you will remove the ligand of cyclic 9, cyclic 7, other cyclic, 
which is again will not be something recommended if you will not conjugate these salades to the HIV specific antibody because again doing that you will lose your body uh, a lot of inflammatory shake point you might cause inflammation but when we use that when we conjugate that to HIV specific uh, antibody removing all kind of salic acids from HIV infected cells could be good because it can initiate multiple immune cells, immune uh, cells against these against these cells. But the salades will not be specific. And for the second part, where we can find alpha two three salic acids everywhere, everywhere in the body will have alpha two three salic acid. It's abundant. Uh, our study just started by the fact that is HIV infected cells have higher level of it. But uh, many places, many cells will have uh, uh, will have alpha two three salic acid. Usually, in the body one of the most areas that have a lot of sialic acid, uh, sorry, a lot of sugars in general are the gut and the gut epithelial cells because this glycans plays a very important role in communication with the microbiome. The microbiome like to cut this sugar and eat it. And so you will find the gut, the lung are heavily glycosylated, probably the gut are the most glycosylated area in the body. But as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, every single cell on earth Without exclusion, there are some cells that do not have nucleus, but they will still have a glycom. Just showing you how important having a glycan is as in a kind of like an essence of living. Uh, but uh, but obviously, different cells will have more or less of different kind of salic acid. And I'm not sure, to the best of my knowledge, that is uh, categorized yet. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Now, we have time for one more question. Are Siglic 7 ligands also expressed on HIV infected cells as Siglic 7 is an inhibitory receptor on NK cells and Siglic 7 expression correlates with other activation receptors? Yeah, that's a great question. So indeed, Siglic, 9, Siglic 7 ligand will be expressed on uh, HIV infected cells. Again, it's not 100% clear the ligand of each siglic, it's believed that is siglic nine, except uh, by siglic nine bind to alpha two three salic acid, while siglic seven can bind to alpha two eight. Some people say alpha two six, and obviously alpha two eight and alpha two six will be expressed on regular cells as well in HIV infected cells. Um, we have looked at siglic seven, and we didn't find that is the the siglic seven, uh, the percentage of siglic seven expressing cells correlate with HIV as the Siglic 9 positive cells do correlate. Um, but however, this was hard because Siglic 7 expressed in many NK cells, almost all uh, CD56 DIM NK cells will express Siglic 7 while only in a sub uh, population of those will express Siglic 9. So all of the Siglic 9 will also express Siglic 7. But we did some analysis uh, to show that it was the Siglic 9 more than the Siglic 7 contribute to the HIV infected cells to evade immune surveillance. Now, this is for HIV infected cells. When we use cancer cell line, that is quite different, where the Siglic 7, but not the Siglic 9, is more important to the cancer. Uh, so everything I show it to you is more about viral infection. And as I mentioned, while there are similarities between cancer cells and virally infected cells, there is obviously also a very clear differences. And that is one of the differences. We found that the Siglic 7 to be more important against can cancer cells, while Siglic 9 seems in our analysis in both HIV and SARS-CoV-2 that is maybe playing in a more important role during viral infection. But again, that is need to be more uh, or better studies, uh, better studied uh, to, to, to be certain. Mohammed, I want to thank you for your presentation today. Would you like to provide any closing remarks to our audience before we go? No, as I mentioned, this is just uh, what I presented is just one uh, quick example of how glycan and glycan lectin interaction could contribute to viral infection. But I, I, I do uh, encourage people to just look for our uh, recent uh, uh, reviews and papers because we study different angles on how, uh, as I mentioned, the recent advances in the field of glycobiology, which is like uh, emerging field. Uh, can allow us to better understand viral host interaction. And while in this reviews and in this paper, we use either HIV 
or SARS-CoV-2, uh, or we focus on HIV or SARS-CoV-2, many of the ideas and the concept we, um, we, we discuss in those reviews on Bieber, I believe could be uh, applicable to many other viral infection. And I think it will be a great opportunity for the viral field to take advantage of this recent advances in this field of glycobiology. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you again, Mohammed, for your time today and for your important research. And before we go, I'd like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, GenScript, for underwriting today's educational webcast. And before we go, I want to thank our audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions and questions that were submitted during the live broadcast and those submitted during the on-demand period that were not addressed will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care everyone and bye-bye. Thanks.